going to take a minute to look at what we looked at last time, um, the high-low dice game, and see if you have any questions on that. And then we're going to look at a second version of the high-low dice game, um, where we've done a little bit of refactoring. Because again, the whole idea of, of sort of this section of the class is the idea of refactoring. Uh, and the whole notion of refactoring is taking code that works and improving it. And improving code usually means making it more maintainable. Um, closely related to maintainable would be reusable. All right. So, for example, in this case, we have a dice game. All right. Um, there are certain things that are in common for all dice games that we would ever make, whether we're doing this high-low game or whether we're doing your Yahtzee or whatever. We have. And again, forgetting about the role-playing 20-sided dice or whatever. Um, we have a, a dice that has six sides. You roll the dice, and you get um, a, a no, random number from one to six every time you roll the dice. And that, that it looks a certain way. Those are characteristics of every dice game that you have. A six looks a certain way. All right? Uh, and so on. So we wrote the first pass of the high-low game without really caring about that, with just solving the problem that we had to solve. And we got the game working, all right, and it's adequate, but it isn't good. And it's not good because we didn't really pay attention to reusability and maintainability, such as if we had to write another dice game, what would we do? So let's look at what we had last time and familiarize ourselves with it. And let's take a minute to um, talk about, first of all, what's wrong with it, and second of all, how we can improve it. Um, we sort of alluded to this when we talked about the Renick truck example, too. How we could have that sort of calculation exist in a couple different places. And we'll come back to that probably on Thursday, I would think. And we'll talk about how we can improve the Renick truck example. Um, so, that it, so that we could do the same calculation on several pages. Because that certainly is something that's feasible, right? Um, if you rent a truck, um, when I rented a truck, I put in my initial information, I got an estimate that this is how much a truck is going to cost. When you go in and actually uh, check in your truck, they put in the actual final information. And then they say, here's what your actual bill is. So, you know, I estimated I would have it for X number of miles. I didn't drive exactly X number of miles. So, therefore, it comes up with a, uh, a slightly different amount. The point is, is that there's two places in their application, in their website or applications, in their system, let's say, that they need to calculate uh, the cost of a rental truck. They need to calculate it uh, to estimate when you're doing a reservation. Then they do the same calculation when you're actually checking in the truck. Well, as we talked about before, it would be horrible if you had to duplicate that functionality in two places. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get it wrong once. All right? Or something's going to change and you're not going to change it correctly. Uh, you might forget about the second place you need to change it. Or you might uh, copy and paste something wrong or whatever. The point being that you don't want redundant code within your application. And therefore, you want to put the code in one place. So the rules for how much a truck costs ought to live in one place. So that if they're changed, they're changed in one place. And we can see a lot of examples of that um, in the case of the dice. The rules for how a, a dice rolls ought to be put in one place. What image you show when you roll a one should be put in one place. And so on. Um, and that's what we're about doing. It's about making components. The .NET framework uh, gives us components for certain pieces of functionality that are common, but we can write our own components for things that are unique to our application. Um, Microsoft, they gave us validation tools. They gave us this kind of component, that kind of component. But they, they didn't give us a rent-a-truck rent component. But if we're in the rent-a-truck business, we can write our own. All right, so let's look at the high-low game that we covered last time, and let's talk about 
Let's look for examples of duplication of code. We can see examples of duplication of code just in this example. And then if we imagine trying to write another dice game, like for example Yahtzee, where you have five dice that you roll, all right, we'll see that there would be, if we were to write one of those uh, pages and we were to apply the same sort of thought process, we would have duplicated code all over the place. So, let's look at, this is the example that we went over last time. Simple game, when you run it, if you remember, you pick whether it's going to be high, 7, or low. High is um, 8 through 12, low is 2 through 6, and 7 is 7. So I make a choice, I pick low, roll the dice, and I lost. Pick seven, roll the dice, and I lost again. All right, finally I win. Now notice that there's a dummy selection indicating please make a selection. Um, you have to do that because a drop down always has an option. So we can put a required field validator, but we have to tell it what the dummy value is. And if you remember, we used a, a dummy value of negative one for that top item on the list. Therefore, when we go in and we make the required field validator, I specify I specify that the initial value is negative 1, which corresponds to that first dummy option has a value of negative 1. Could have made that anything, but negative 1 was simple enough. All right, let's look at the code. The code is pretty straightforward. And this is where you might think, well, this works. The code's simple enough. It would be simple enough to change. What's really the benefit of refactoring? And the refactoring in this case deals probably more with reusability. You know, there would be, I suppose, a chance that we'd want to put this logic on another page. But more likely than that, we would have another dice game that we would want to have on our page. All right? And therefore, if all the code lives on the event, um, then we won't be able to reuse it. So we look. We have a button, my, my button click event. I declare an integer for the two dice, an integer for the total, a boolean it indicates if they won, and finally a user choice if, uh, for, for what the user has chosen. I create an object to generate random numbers, and I generate two numbers between one and seven. Now, is actually going to be between 1 and 0.699999. So it's really a number between 1 and 6. All right. I add those two together. I assume they lost unless they won. Again, you can code this a couple different ways. Um, if you tried to code it the other way, assuming that they've won, and then check to see if they've lost, you'd find that the if statements are a little bit harder to write little bit more involved. So therefore, this is easier to, to code, so that's why I picked it. I look to see if the user choice is zero and the total is less than seven, means you have a winner. What, how did I know the user choice was zero? Well, that was my values for my items. Low has a value of zero, 
7 has a value of 1, high has a value of 2. Remember, with the drop down, there's always the, 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 the label or the, the, the description that the user sees, but there's always behind the scenes a value. And that value from a programming perspective is what's important. All right. If they've rolled a one, if they've rolled a seven and their choice was one or a seven, then they've won. If they've rolled a two and their choice is greater than seven, then they've won. If they've won, then I display that they've won. Otherwise, I display that they have lost. I then take and construct the URL for two images. I have on my web page two images. And these images initially don't have a URL. So they're just blank images. After I roll the dice, though, I take and I put, I set the URL to be images slash D, the value of the dice, plus a PNG. So I'm dynamically constructing the URL of the image. So the URL of the image is simply, it's in the images folder, and it's simply D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, and D6. I could have named them the words 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all right? But then I'd have a whole messy set of if statements. If value equals 1, then my image name is images slash O-N-E dot P-N-G. Whereas here, I can just, with one clean statement, I can simply say, take the value of that dice, convert it to string, and use that as part of the image's name. Images is the folder in which it resides in. It's sort of the same as when you did basic web programming. In other words, my page is in my web folder, my web server's root directory. The images folder is underneath that. So to go underneath the folder, I simply say images slash, and then I have the name of the image. And I have to concatenate the .png on the end as well. I put those two images in a panel, so I don't display anything in the panel until I've set all those values. That way I don't see a broken image. Any questions about this? Now what's duplicated about this? What's duplicated about this is the process of rolling the dice and the process of getting the image that belongs to that dice. Now that may not sound like a big deal. But your goal as a programmer is to eliminate redundant code wherever you can find it. That should set alarms off on your head. Whenever you see statements that look real similar, that's a sign that maybe you need to write a function or perhaps even create a class for it. All right. Um. I'm going to go. I think I have some dice in my office. This lecture is getting boring. Let's just play dice for the rest of the, the, rest of the time. No, I'm, I'm going to go because I want to demonstrate something. All right.
chunk of code called a class to have to control um, and put all the code related to a dice. All right, so I have two dice here. So let's imagine I'm playing this game, but I'm playing it the old-fashioned way. I'm going to need a player who wants to play. Okay. What do you pick? High, low, or seven? Seven. Okay. All right. Six and five, you lose. All right. How do I know that? This dice is uh, this dice is six. This dice is five. I add them together. It's eleven. It's not seven. Therefore, you lose. Let's try again. You gotta pick and I gotta wait for you to pick. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, hi. Oh, you lost. Alright. Because it was four and two. Alright. Let's think of what the dice needs to do in this game. Because we're gonna write software to do this. And software you think about functions and attributes and things like that. Alright? What's an attribute of the dice? Yeah, well, an attribute of the dice is the side that's showing, right? The side that was rolled, all right? So a dice has a value. A die or a dice. That's always a tricky I'm never sure exactly how to say that. What are things that you can do to the dice? What are things that I did when I was playing the role of the pair of dice? I roll the dice. And when I roll the, the dice, it doesn't do me any good to just roll the dice. I told you the value. And the other thing that I want to do is I actually showed you the dice. So show the face of the dice. All right. So a die has a value. This is an attribute in object-oriented terms. And these are methods or functions. Now, when I roll the dice, what's the value going to be? What, what kind of data am I going to return? An integer. All right. So when you roll the dice, the return value is an integer. When I show the face of the dice, what am I... What's my return value there? Pardon me? An image. Or, the way we're going to do it, you're right, but the way we're going to do it is we're going to return the path to the image. So we're going to return a string. All right, I need two people to be dice. There'll be two people in this room. 
<laughs> Although, if anyone wants to come in outside, I, I need I need some help here. You know. Well, you, do you still want to play? Yeah. Okay. So you can still be played. We have a dice here. We have dice here. All right. I'm going to ask the player for their choice. I am then going to ask each of the dice to roll themselves. Roll the dice, that is. You don't have to roll yourself, all right? <laughs> And then you'll tell me what the value of your dice is. Then I will ask you to show the face. And then you'll hold out the face that was showing. That's your job. Those are the only things you can respond to. All right? For the rest of the semester. No, just kidding. <laughs> just for, for this exercise, those are the only things you can do. I, I, I'm going to specifically ask you to roll. You will tell me the value. I will specifically ask you to show the face. And you'll show the face. Okay, what's your pick? Hi. Okay, roll. And tell me the answer. One. One. Roll. Five. Five. Now show me the face. Okay. Five, one, six. You lose. Let's try this again. Uh, hi. Hi. Okay, roll. Temp two. Uh, roll. Three, show me the face. Show me the face. Five and three is, no, two and three or five, you lose. Okay. This is what we're going to write code to do. Our class is going to have an attribute, the value of the dice. Our class can do two things. We can ask the dice to do two things. We can ask the dice to roll. And we can, when the dice rolls, it's going to tell us the value. And then we can ask the dice to show the face, and it's going to it's going to give us it's not going to it's going to give us the, the path to the image, so we can see the value on the dice. So that's what we're going to do. All right. So let me open up the second version of this application that's been refactored to use. a dice class. So what is a class? A class is where you write the description of everything that some part of your problem can do. So for example, in this game, what's part of our problem? Part of our problem is dice, right? We have dice in this problem. So we're going to write code that can do everything that we would ever ask a dice to do. And when we define the class, we simply define what capabilities are there for members of that class. What attributes we have, what methods we have. We've already defined that a class has a value. That's an attribute. A class also has two methods. We can tell it to roll, and we can tell it to show us the face. All right? So we're going to write code to do that, all right? And then we are going to make as many dice as we need for whatever game we're going to play. Now that game was a two dice game. There's other games where there's five dice. The good news is, is we don't have to duplicate this functionality five times. We simply use our class and create five individual dice. So we're creating a template for a dice here. We then go and actually create as many dice as we need to solve the problem at hand. So let's go and open this. I'm going to show you the end result, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got there. All right, if I run this, functionally, it doesn't look any different. I don't think it looks any different. Please make choice. Roll the dice. You win or you lose. 
Most of the time you lose. All right. So functionally, this looks identical to the other version. Because remember, refactoring isn't is about writing the code more efficiently so that it can be more easily maintained and more easily um, um, extended, all right, and reused. So what I did is I took and I created a die class, die being the singular of dice. How do you create a class? You go up to File, New, File, and then you simply create a class. By default, it will put it in an app code folder. All right, so let it do that. If you don't create it in that folder, it will ask you, should I create it in the app code folder? So say yes. So I'm going to go and I'm just going to create uh, an example class. So I'll go new file class. I give it a name. The name should be descriptive. It should say what it represents. Um, I'll get some people to write great code, but their classes are named something like class 1, class 2, class 3, and so on. That's very difficult if anyone wants to use those classes, because they have to actually crack them open and look at them to see what it is they actually do. Remember, part of maintainability is naming things correctly, so that you don't have to spend hours researching what's the name of the class that you want to use, that is obvious to you. Since this is just an example, I'll say example. I click add. And it put it by default in the app code folder. If you get a question, like if I was in another folder and I tried to do it, it will ask me if I want to put it there. And it gives you sort of an empty framework for your class here. All right. So what constitutes a class? Well, first of all, we have the attributes. All right. What attributes does a dice have? Well, we already said it had one. It has a integer that I gave a name of value to. Notice where that's defined. This is defined outside of any functions. So it's an attribute of the entire class, which means I can use that attribute anywhere in the class. These attributes are sometimes called instance variables, which means that each instance or each specific die in our application is going to have its own value for this. Just like if I rolled five dice, each of them could have their own value. All right. I also define sort of as an attribute the random number generator because I'm going to use that a lot. Um, interesting thing of making this public or private static, that guarantees better randomness because there's only going to be one random number generator instead of multiple random number generators. Notice I've made these private. Attributes ought to be private. Why? Because we don't want other programmers to mess with our class and to do things to our class that they shouldn't do. For example, how does a dice get its value? It gets a value by rolling it. What are the proper values for a dice? One through six. All right? We would not want someone to write a program to assign a seven to the value of a dice. If we made these attributes public, then other programmers could introduce bugs. going in and manipulating those attributes directly. We want to control how those attributes get set. Therefore, we write the code that manipulates those attributes. So in other words, the only way to get a value for the dice is to roll it. So when I roll the dice, it generates a random value and it returns a value. 
That way, if you want to use a dice, you have to use the roll method because you cannot directly get the value of the dice. Our methods, on the other hand, both of these methods are public because we want other classes to be able to do this. The public methods are the, are the, are the things that the dice can respond to and do. Remember I told the two guys that were playing the role of the dice that you could only do two things that correspond to these two methods. I could ask you to roll, in which case they rolled. In our case, we generated a random number. And they told me the result of the roll. They told me that the value was 2 or 6 or whatever. The other thing I asked them to do is I, I asked them to be able to show me the face. Well, essentially, that's what this code is here, is to show me the face. It gives me the name of the, Im uh, of the image. And what's the name of the image? Well, it's in a folder called images, and it's D followed by the value of the dice. So these are the two things that I want the dice to be able to do. I want to be able to roll the dice, and I want the dice to be able to show me what the face looks like. When I roll the dice, I want it to tell me what it got as an answer. So I put this behavior in a separate class. What is the advantage of that? Well, let's look at how we use that in the high-low dice game. Now, my button roll I don't have any dice logic in it. Well, let me rephrase that. There's no code in the roll that corresponds to the things that the dice do. For everything that I want a dice to do, I ask the dice object to do. How do I ask the dice object? Well, how many dice do I need? I need two. So I create my two by pair of dice. I create it using this statement. Die D1 equals new die. So what does that do? That creates for me a brand new dice object. Remember, the class is a template. This is a list of things that a die can do. Here I'm actually making specific examples, specific instances specific members of the dice family, die one and die two. Notice I don't have any logic here at all that says how you roll a dice. I simply ask the dice to roll, just like I asked the two people in this class. And whatever answer they give me, I store in the integers. I add it together, I check the results, Finally, when I'm done, I ask the die to give me, to show me your face. Give me the image that corresponds to your face. So I replaced specific logic about the dice with a class that does everything that a dice needs to be able to do. Then I don't have to worry about coding it wrong. The next game I code. I might, for example, have a programmer that doesn't realize that this needs to be 1 through 7, all right, and tries to make it 1 through 6, or tries generating the random number a different way that isn't good, all right. Well, I've removed that out of that person's hands. I've written and I've given and I've provided to anyone writing in this application a dice component that you can use, all right. And again, I have two dice, I roll them, I sum up their total, and I get the answer. As a general rule, your event handlers, like the button click event and things like that, shouldn't have a lot of business logic in it. That should be delegated to some other object. All right. The reason for that is if the code lives in the button click event, then it can't be used anywhere else. 
Whereas now my code to roll a dice can be used anywhere that I want to roll dice. Questions about this? So I created a die class. Let me get rid of the example. Created a die class. I put in the class the attributes that I need, my methods that I need, and then anywhere I need a dice, I create a dice using this technique, and then I can ask it to do the things that I've defined that a dice can do. To roll, and to get the name of the image to show the face of the dice. Now, to give a glimpse of how this might be beneficial, let's look at another dice game. Let's look at Yahtzee. Yahtzee, for those that, you, that don't know, you roll five dice. You get three chances to roll five dice. So you roll the five dice, you roll all five of them the first time. The second time, you get to pick which ones you want to re-roll. And then the third time, you get to pick which ones you want to re-roll again. And your idea is to come up with combinations. Like, I think the highest scoring combination is all five dice having the same value. So if I were to roll three sixes, a two, and a one, I would leave the three sixes, pick up the two and a one, and roll them again and I would be trying to get five sixes. And you get different points for the combination. So like if you get three of a kind, you get a certain number of points. If you get five of a kind, you get a certain number of points, and so on. If you get them all sequentially, like one, two, three, four, five, you get a certain number of points, and, and so on down the line. Full house. Yeah, full house, and, and yeah, exactly. So you have a lot of, uh, a lot of scoring combinations. But the, the point is, the most relevant point is, is that you get five dice to roll. Well, if we did this the old way, we would have to write the random number call five times and the logic to determine the image. What we have here, though, is we have I can roll the dice. This isn't, this isn't close to the full game, but it's just rolling five dice. All right, I think the next version of this, I, don't, I, I, never, I did not write a complete Yahtzee game, but I gave the ability to choose which dice you wanted to see and which dice you didn't want to see. All right, so there I got three of a kind. Let's look at the code for this. Good news is I don't have to rewrite any of the dice code. I don't have to write the random numbers to, to randomly pick a number from 1 to 6. I've already done that. And I've defined a function that allows me to roll a dice. And I put it someplace separate from that high-low game page so that I can use it in any other page that I write. So I can use it in my Yahtzee page. What's my Yahtzee page look like? Well, the design of it, I simply have a button and five images. The code behind, when they press the image, or when they press the button, all I do is I create my five dice, I roll them, and I display the image. Now again, a dice is a pretty simple thing, all right? Rolling the dice really only consists of a line of code. Showing the image only consists of a line of a code. So you might think, well, how is this really a big deal? All I've done is replace one line of code with another line of code. Well, it's a big deal because, first of all, it's a simple line of code. I don't have to know anything about how to generate a random number. I just need to know that I call the, the roll function on a dice to do that. Likewise, to display the image. The other reason it's good is rolling a dice could actually be 
a more complicated function. All right. For example, instead of rolling a dice, I could be perform truck rental calculation, which isn't going to be just one line of code, but it's going to be multiple lines of code. So it would be very useful for us to have that code in one place so we don't have to rewrite it each time. Questions about this so far? What I'm doing, by the way, is I'm looking in week three. I have a couple versions of this dice game, and I'm just pulling them down one at a time, and we're looking at them. So let's pull the next version down. These are in week three, and I've just been going down. All right, we went over this one, this one. Looks like we have two more to go. I'm not sure what the difference is, but we'll take a look. See if Yahtzee changed it all, first of all. It didn't. So what did change? The high-low game changed. Because look, lo and behold, I now have a class for the high-low game. Okay? What's the advantage of doing this? Well, if I ever wanted to have the high-low game appear anywhere else in my application or solution, Maybe I have a mobile game to play this, all right, in addition to a web version of it, all right? Or maybe this existed on a couple different pages or whatever, all right? I've taken the rules for the high-low game, and I have moved everything about, like, what the rules are, and I've put them in the high-low class. So let's run this. And let's see again functionally, not any different. Ooh, I'm on a roll. But I've moved code around. And I think to appreciate the benefit of this, look how clean the code is. It's really just a handful of lines of code. I've took all the logic about what it is to play the game and I've moved it to another place. Now you'll notice that a lot. And when we're talking about refactoring, we're talking about something, taking something that works and make it good. That creating components, taking chunks of code and putting it in other places is always a strategy in refactoring. Because when code lives as part of a big giant blob of code, it's very difficult to reuse that code. But when you break code down into neat little components, it becomes much easier to use. So we don't want a lot of code in these events because these events are closely related to the page. We want the code to be elsewhere. And in this case, it's going to be in a custom class. Now, 
We see this in other examples. We see this in PHP, for example, when we create include files, those of you that have done PHP. We see this in CSS, where we create external CSS files. We see this in JavaScript, where we create external JavaScript files. The idea of taking code and putting it in little pieces is something that's very useful and adds to the maintainability and reusability of the code, provided it's done correctly. So what did we do here? I created a second class that's everything about the game. Interesting thing here is that my web page doesn't even need to worry about dice anymore. It just needs to worry about this game. So I create a high-low game object a class. When I play the game, I give the user's choice of whether they picked high, low, or seven. I go, I have my two dice, I roll the dice, I add them up, I check to see if they've won or lost, and then I've returned, I return whether they have won or lost. I then have a method to return the first dice's value and a method to return the second dice's value. That makes coding here real simple. All right. When I click the button, what do I do? I create a new high-low game. I grab the value from the drop-down, I call the play method in my high-low game object, which takes my choice, rolls the two dice, adds up the values, see if I won or lost, won or lost, then it returns a boolean. True if I've won, false if I've lost. I then look at that boolean, and if I've won, I display that I've won, if I've lost, I display that I've lost, and I grab the two images and display that on the screen. So there's no, I want to say the word knowledge, there's no logic about the game at all in the user event. The user event simply calls the appropriate methods on the appropriate object and they do the work. All right, it's a very good way to separate the code because each thing is doing its own job. The user interface is handling the way that is being displayed and the, um, the um, business rule objects are handling this. So for example, I could write, if I was studying statistics, let's say, I could write code that randomly played a thousand games and randomly picked high every time and it could tell me how many times I won or lost. So I could reuse this object in something like that if I was analyzing statistics. Or I could pick seven every time and it could tell me out of how many games how many times I won or lost. All right. Let's do that. Let's, let's play a thousand games and we'll pick seven every time and we'll see how often we win. All right, I'm going to create a new page. two labels on the page. Why might I want 
want to do this as a game designer? Why might I want, if I was studying statistics or probability, that would be one reason to do this. But why as a game designer might I want to write a little page like this? Yes? Just to verify that the randomness is working out correct. All right? Make sure there's no glitches in it. Like if you imagine a card game, you know, if, if there was a card game and for whatever reason you were writing a blackjack game and for whatever reason you dealt aces more often than you should, well, that would be a problem, right? So I could play it myself and sort of look to see if, if things were showing up right. But I know the probabilities, right? If you pick low, you should win one out, or no, if you pick seven, you should win one out of six times. So, because there are um, 36 combinations of dice, and six of them are seven. So you should win one out of six times if I pick seven. So if I play this a thousand times, I should expect to hit, to win, 160-ish times. No, 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 yeah, 160-ish times. All right. So if I pick seven and I win 500 times, then there's something wrong with my code. All right. Now again, there's going to be variations. I'm not going to hit 160 sometimes every time. Right. I might run this once and hit 158 and run it again and hit 172. But it ought to be in the ballpark. All right. So I'm going to go and put code in here. Write my standard for loop, which I'm sure you've all seen before, to iterate through them uh, a thousand times. I'm going to create my high low object. so I can easily change how many times I play the game. user's choice, which for a 7, the user's choice is 1. And then when I'm all done, two labels, how many times I played the game, and how many times I won. So let's go and run this guy. One thing I one thing you can do is if you right mouse on this and you can say set as start page, it will open it up with that page right away. Alright, 170 out of 1,000 times, that's in the ballpark. 141, it's also in the ballpark. 196, 157. 
Let's try running it 10,000 times. More times we run it, the closer we should get to the um, proper distribution. Notice how these numbers are closer to that. I think it would be 166666 repeating. All right. So, this sort of verifies that our logic is correct because we played randomly so many games. So we could we could run this, you know, through and run scenarios and all that and, and test it out. The point of this is is yeah, it would be a good idea to do this. But notice how easy it was because all the rules for the game live somewhere else. I don't have to duplicate the rules for the game here. Because if I duplicated the rules for the game here, I'd be defeating my purpose. I'd be testing this code, not the code of the actual game. All right? So by putting that code in a class, all right, um, I um, have the advantage of actually being able to test that code and making sure that it works. All right. Questions? So we now have the advantage of having the dice and having the game in its own class. So we can use those classes wherever we want to. Again, Notice what we're doing. We're taking code that used to originally live here and we're putting it in someplace else, someplace separate that we can use. All right. I think we have one more version of this that we can look at. I'm not going to upload that test case. That would be a good one for you to duplicate if you are interested in that example. wrote something called the five dice game here, which is similar to Yahtzee. Let's set that one as a start page. So let's look and see how this works. All right. Initially, everything is checked. So I'm going to roll all five dice. So now I could check or uncheck which dice I want to re-roll. So I'm going to uncheck these. I'm going to uncheck these. I'm going to keep the two fours. So I'm going to try rolling the other three. And I'm going to try that again. Yep, and that's what I end up with. So I can choose to pick or not, and then I can re-roll as many or as few of them as I want. This is sort of the start of the game Yahtzee. All right, in actual Yahtzee, you only get three turns, where this gives you an unlimited number of turns, and after three turns, it tells you what you've scored and so on. So let's take a look at this. 
what do I have in the web page? I have five images and five checkboxes. What do I have in my code behind for this? I create my dice in the page load event. Why do you suppose I create my dice in the page load event and not in not in the button click event? Because I don't want to start with a new set of dice each time. I want to have the same dice every time. So I simply go in and say, if the checkbox is checked, then I roll that dice. Otherwise, I don't roll the dice. Actually, I didn't get as far along as I thought I did. I thought I was keeping track of the number of rolls, and I have the code in there, or I have the variables for that, but I don't actually have any code for that. The point of these like last couple of things that we looked at are showing that when you take a certain piece of functionality and put it somewhere else, then writing code to use that functionality becomes easy. You have effectively created a component that does a certain job. Anytime you need to use that component, your job becomes easy then. All right? Now, let's turn our attention back to the truck rental example. And we're not going to have time to address this, but we're going we're to um, sort of get you thinking in, in the direction um, that we're going to go to on Thursday. Here's the last iteration of Zeller's rent a truck. Here's what the on-click event looks like now. We check to see if is valid. We gather the different values from our form, the number of days, the number of miles. We then check to see, um, we check to see what size of truck was selected. We go in and set the rate based on that. We do a calculation, and then we display that. How is this going to change when we refactor this to be a class? What is our class going to be? What are we going to call our class, first of all? I'll give you a hint. It's not class one. What are we going to call the class? What is our class going to represent? What do we call our die class? We call it die. What do we call our high-low game class? High-low game. What are we going to call this class? Truck rental. All right. Truck or truck rental, either one of those. All right. Specifically, we're dealing with, with, I guess it would depend on how far we were taking this. Truck rental would be good if all we were focused on is renting the truck. 
if we were actually going to do a bigger system that maybe included the maintenance of a truck um, and other it's financing of the truck, purchasing it, repairing it, we might call it truck because then everything about the truck would be in there. But truck rental would be good for this. All right. What attributes does that truck rental have? What are the characteristics of a truck rental? Number of days? Number of days, cost, and, and, and rate, yeah. Um, and um, number of miles, too. I, you might have already said that. I might have just mistakenly said number of days. So we're going to create a class that has those. What methods are we going to have? We might have a get days method. We might have a get the rate method, right? Because maybe we don't, you know, maybe we're not calculating a specific thing, but we just want to display on our web page, hey, uh, a medium-sized truck costs $20. Do we want that $20, the amount of the rate, to appear on a bunch of different pages? No, we want one place for that rate to live. All right? What other methods might we, what might we have? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the mileage rate or the mileage cost. And then finally, we're going to have a method for the total cost. How much did it cost to rent this? So what's our code going to look like here? Our code is going to be very simplified. All right. Our code is simply going to be gathering the information from this form, start date, end date, number of miles, size of truck, and so on, it's going to create the truck rental object. It's going to set those properties. It's going to ask the class or the object to do the, the rate or, or the, the, the cost calculation. And then it's going to take the result of that and it's going to display it. So our code here is going to have none of the rules of, well, a medium-sized truck is $30, is, is $30 a day, and a large truck is $40, and a small is $20, that it's $75 for miles, and so on and so forth. All that calculation is going to be in there. And the job of this code behind it is simply going to be to gather the data from the form, create the object, use the appropriate methods on the truck rental, and take the answer and display the results. All right. That way, um, we'll be able to reuse that object in the reservation page, in the page that displays um, the, the final uh, calculation of the fee, the checkout page or check-in page, and so on. So that's where we will pick up next time. We'll go over and we'll create this. The, the game example, I kind of went through showing you sort of the completed results. This example will sort of build from the ground up. So um, my hope is, is that that will be um, beneficial to you. All right. We'll see you over in lab. I'm going to um, come back. I'm going to unlock the door.